my name is Matt Matravers, and um, welcome to this third session in the, uh, the Criminal Justice Day. A particular welcome to those of you, I recognize many of you who've been here for the previous two sessions. Congratulations on your resilience, and uh, thank you very much for sticking with us. Um, I should also apologize, you are not meant to get this much of me. No, nobody other than my wife, who unfortunately you know, said yes at the wrong moment, should ever have to endure, endure me twice in a day. Um, this session was meant to be chaired by a colleague from, um, from York, Charlie Lloyd, but unfortunately he's uh, fallen ill with a stomach bug, and so I've stepped in. So I'm sorry that you've had to endure quite so much of me. Our final session is on prisons, whether prisons work, if they work, in what way they work, um, and what we might do differently. Some of you will know that the UK has uh, the per capita, one of the highest incarceration rates, certainly in the, in the developed liberal democratic world. We incarcerate far more people than comparative countries other than the United States. And many of you will know that despite the fact that we continue to use this almost as a a default for certain kinds of crimes, recidivism rates are very high, uh, prison is very expensive, and what we're going to be looking at is not just uh, prison and prison as a punishment, but also part of the mission statement of the prison service is to prepare inmates for productive lives on the outside. And so I hope we'll be looking at and discussing you know, how that happens, how it doesn't happen, and also how services beyond prison can help people to live non-criminal lives uh, after their um, sentence, and in particular what we might learn from other countries who do it differently and arguably do it better. So those are our questions, and fortunately we have a fantastic panel of experts who are going to, in the following, uh, the same format as before, each uh, will get about seven minutes um, to present, then there'll be a short sort of discussion amongst the panel with me, and then we'll open it up to the audience and to a, to a general discussion. So, and as before in the first session, I'm not going to give the full biographies of our speakers. They are all so distinguished that it would take all day. Um, so I'll just give you the highlights in the order in which they're going to speak. So Angela Cohen to my left. Um, says here, a working class kid from Manchester with Irish roots, but we, I won't hold that against you, Angela. Um, really learned to navigate the social care system to see how vital service users, strong adv advocates for service users are as a young carer for a gran. She then went on to study politics and modern history in Manchester, and during her MSc in social work in Bristol, worked in a variety of community social care roles before finding a passion for working in areas of substance misuse and mental health. This, Work took her behind prison walls, not as a prison officer, working with men who were incarcerated um, and gave her the hope and conviction that intervention prior to release could rehabilitate, change lives, and change the world. She went on research trauma-informed approaches in the criminal justice system in Norway and the USA um, and as guest lectured in Bristol. Angela left frontline work, front work in 2016, disillusioned by a criminal system, by a system that seems designed to destroy all hope of rehabilitation. And her book, uh, Criminal, which was available outside, but I understand is sold out, but Angela tells me she has two copies that she will give to the, to, to the bookseller on, on departure, so there will be, uh, there'll be two for, for the first two rushes. Uh, a, a debut nonfiction book, Criminal, um, shares the stories of men she met while working in prison, um, highlights the ways in which our incarceration system is, Britain, is, is broken, but also looks to the experiences that um, she found in Norway to think about how we might do things differently. Alice Evans is a lecturer in criminology at the University of Liverpool, and she is interested in punishment and the ways it is and isn't related to justice. Much of her work has been about the imprisonment of men convicted of sex offences and based on interviewing and ethnographic work in prisons in England and Wales. Her recent book, The Stains of Imprisonment, Moral Communication in Men Convicted of Sex Offences, draws on this work and explores what being held in prison said to prisoners about who they were and what they had done. Jeff Page, third along, is a colleague here at the University of York in the School for Business and Society. Following an early adulthood of drug and alcohol dependence, serious mental illness, and regular arrest, Jeff entered residential rehab and progressed to work as an addictions counselor with a criminal justice caseload. He subsequently completed a doctorate on drug misusing arrestees with complex needs. 
Jeff came to York to work on the national evaluation of pilot drug recovery wings and has continued to work in particular on the question of, of drugs and drug dependent offenders and their particular and needs that require specialized intervention. Finally, Justin Russell, at the end, is His Majesty's Chief Inspector of Probation. Justin became Chief Inspector in June 2019 and was reappointed for a second term and recently announced that he'll step down in September 2023. Justin's previous role from 2016 to the beginning of 2019 was Director General, Justice Analysis and Offender Policy at the Ministry of Justice. He started his career as a social researcher in the Home Office and has worked in a wide range of criminal justice issues, including as a senior policy advisor on home affairs in the Number 10 Policy Unit and as head of the Violent Crime Unit in the Home Office. So as you see, we've got a fantastic mix of academic and practitioner um, expertise on the panel, and so I will shut up and I will hand over to Angela. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So I've got the notes to try and keep me on time, but please just nudge me if not. And just a quick caveat before I start, I'm going to use he and him as the pronouns usually when I describe people in prison. That's just because of my experience in men's prisons. So I'm not discounting the thousands of women we also lock up by doing that. And as you mentioned, we lock up more people here than any other place in Western Europe, and that's set to increase to about 100,000 souls by around 2026. Now, when I worked on the substance misuse wing, we would sit in group therapy sessions and talk about what are the consequences of continuing to smoke crack. And we talked about this, and we had a saying that was, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same results. So... It absolutely baffles me why we think just doubling down and doing more of something that doesn't work is going to have a different result. Now, beyond the very specific effects of increased incarceration, because I think we're going to discuss lots of that later, I wanted today to talk about the cultural effect on our society when we accept mass incarceration, incarceration for profit, and punitive punishment as our only weapons of choice against criminality. What does this do to the soul of a society, a community, a country, when it becomes our only way of dealing with people who do not follow our agreed upon social conventions and laws? And if we continue to sleepwalk towards this privatised, supersized prison estate, I believe that we're going to slide further towards a culture of individualism. And the effect of this is an erosion of collective responsibility that sees only the criminal as the problem rather than viewing his behaviour in a wider context. And this leads to the effect that we, come, we become kind of like us out in the community and them behind prison walls. And it adds up this othering of people. And we see it in all aspects of life. So in the past couple of weeks, there's been a real vilification in the press of disabled benefits claimants. And it makes it easier to chip away at a welfare state that was created to hold and support our most vulnerable members of society. And the reason I think this is particularly dangerous when it comes to the criminal justice system is because political rhetoric and newspaper headlines would already have us believe that criminals are a completely different species to you and I. And seeing people as a different species allows us to not care about them. But prisons are not full of monsters. They are stacked to the rafters with thousands of people who've been woefully failed by the state, society, and therefore by all of us. And we have a collective responsibility to address that. And if we accept mass incarceration as the norm, we give our tacit approval for politicians to abdicate responsibility for some of the most vulnerable citizens in society. And the effect of this is then a further dismantling after over a decade of austerity of what is left of our welfare state. And I think we've heard a lot about this today, but just like criminality, rehabilitation does not happen in a vacuum. And when I was in Norway, I heard so many times this, who would you want as your neighbour, as just the foundational question that guided their approach to criminal justice. And this is a question that implies community. And it implies there's a net positive effect on the whole of society 
when we choose to extend our support to those who've wronged us. And I do think there are some very dangerous people currently incarcerated, and they absolutely do need to be kept away from society for a time to keep us all safe. But almost every single one of them one day will be released. And what kind of neighbours are we hoping for by banging up even more of them? Now, we talked about this a little bit in the talk earlier, but surveys, about public, surveys around public perceptions show that we don't feel any safer by incarcerating more people. And life satisfaction surveys show that the happiest countries are the ones that have this strong sense of community and social responsibility. But we can only strengthen and build community if we acknowledge that we must provide and maintain a safety net to help people avoid or support people to get out of a life where incarceration is a consequence. So the effect of this mass privatised prison building project goes beyond crime and punishment, I believe. I think it goes to the heart of who we are as a nation and who we want to be. Because if we're willing to accept the incarceration of tens of thousands of mentally unwell, addicted, homeless, traumatised, care-experienced men, women and children, we are accepting as truth that our country has real equality of opportunity and that the individual is at fault if he messes up. And if the individual's at fault, he doesn't deserve a safety net. If we accept we shouldn't provide a safety net, we accept that we don't have responsibility to other members of our communities. We're all out for ourselves. It's our individual effort and hard work if we sink or swim. And to me, this feels positively Dickensian, this kind of approach. And it's not the world I want to live in. And in spite of, or, or maybe because of, spending so many years working in social care, I fundamentally believe in the good in people. And Joanna touched on this earlier, but I think we're better than our worst behaviours. And we're not only what we did in our lowest moments. I think we're greater than the sum of our parts and we thrive when we work together. And I was asked to kind of briefly mention some of the alternatives to this mass incarceration. And there are hundreds. So there's drug decriminalisation in Portugal that works really well. There's community orders. There are... The community orders, our own government data shows that for short sentences, they're more effective than custodial sentences. There's training and education we see in Norwegian prisons. Restorative justice approaches we talked about earlier and treating addiction as a health issue rather than a criminal one. And our policymakers all know this. They know things work better than prison. And yet, they don't follow the data and evidence. And I think the real effect of this is both spiritually and economically, we are all the poorer for it. Um, and I will stop myself there. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alice. Uh, thanks so much. Um, that was really interesting. I, uh, and thank you all for coming today on a Sunday evening and on a really, really, really gorgeous day. So thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm taking on the slightly difficult task of talking about what the effect of imprisoning more people in cases of sexual offending and sexual violence will be. And so normally, I think when groups of people like us get together to talk about whether we should transform or reform or shrink or even abolish the prison system, the focus tends to be, for very understandable reasons, on more obviously sympathetic cases. Um, but I think it's really important to focus on the difficult cases too. And that's because I think it is true that quite a lot of people in prison have done some really, really bad things. Quite a lot of people in prison are quite scary. And people who have committed sexual offences are not a small proportion of the prison population. It's about a fifth of our current prison population. That's a big increase over the last few decades. There are four times as many men in prison serving a sentence for a sex offence as there are women overall. So it's quite a big group of the prison population. And they're also a significant part of the projected increase in the prison population, which Daman mentioned earlier. So the projected increase over the next kind of five years, there's lots of reasons for that. But one is an attempt on the part of the government to increase numbers of prosecutions in cases of rape. And another is uh, an attempt to lengthen cases sentences in cases of sexual violence. Another reason why I think it's important to talk about this group is that they're uh, demographically very different 
uh, to other members of the prison population, and in particular that they're often very old. Um, not, that's not always the case, but the mean age is shifted upwards. There are a lot of people imprisoned for historic offences in their 70s, 80s and 90s because of um, that's often how long it takes for people who have um, been offended against while children to report and more, probably more importantly to be taken seriously when they do report. So my guess is that there are people in the room who, when I say a big part of the reason why the prison population has gone up and why it's about to go up is because of imprisoning more people for longer for sex offences, are thinking, well, that doesn't sound like such a problem then. Um, may, I, I feel, you know, I've been, I've been encouraged to come here on the basis that something's wrong and maybe something isn't that wrong. And I think that's a really understandable response. Um, uh, we know that uh, there is a really serious problem with the prevalence of sexual violence, but also with how unseriously it is taken uh, by, by our state and with very low charging rates and low conviction rates in cases of sexual violence. So there's a big problem on people's route in to the prison system. But I also think it's really interesting that once they're in the prison system, they're subject often to different rules and different policies which affect their routes out. So, for example, John Podmore mentioned earlier home detention curfews, um, early release of people are tagged, People who, are, people who are serving sentences for sex offences are not eligible for HDC. Um, there's, they often have problems getting to open prisons uh, because many open prisons won't take people convicted of sex offences and we know there's a big problem with, um, with open prisons at the moment, which was also mentioned earlier, but there's also a kind of structural problem with shortage of open spaces for people convicted of sex offences. Under COVID, there were plans to release people um, to kind of uh, make, make things safer in prisons. In the end, that policy barely happened. I think only a handful of people were released, but from the very beginning, people convicted of sex offences were excluded from that policy, despite the fact that they were very much the demographic who were most at risk of dying. So given all of this, um, I, I guess my, my, the question I'm going to briefly address is, is, is more prison the answer for dealing with, with cases of sexual violence? And what do we think prisons are for? We think it's for two things. I think, on the whole, we think it's for increasing safety and we think it's for justice. And so will sending more people to prison for longer make people safer? So I don't think that there are no circumstances under which we should coercively hold people apart from the rest of the society because of the risks that they pose. And I think it's definitely appropriate that uh, there are people who are held apart from society uh, because of the dangers that we face from them. But lengthening all sentences in cases of sexual offences by a few years is not a very thought through or effective or targeted strategy um, for dealing with these types of offences. And I think that for several reasons. One is that actually sex offending covers a very broad spectrum of offences and there is strong evidence that shows there are very, very different reoffending rates amongst that, that, uh, amongst that group. On the whole, people convicted of sex offences actually have strikingly low reoffending rates. So of the different categories of offences of people in the criminal justice system, people currently serving sentences for sex offences have the lowest reoffending rates of any category of offending. So lowest reconviction rates of any category of offending. And there's also no real evidence that imprisoning people in general or imprisoning people for longer makes a difference to their likelihood of reoffending when they get out. So a blanket policy of, you know, just lengthening things by a year, there's no clear sense that that will make, uh, make us any safer when people get out. And I also think that focusing our attention, if our goal is to create safety in cases of sexual violence um, on the people who we know have already committed cases, acts of sexual violence, involves looking in the wrong place for the problem. Most sexual violence is committed by people with no prior convictions for sexual violence. And there's clear evidence that there are huge numbers of interventions that we could be making in the sorts of social and situational and cultural factors that lead to sexual violence. So we could be doing so much more about safeguarding. We could be transforming institutions much more effectively in which we know that sexual violence is taking place. We could be providing much more consent training and sexual citizenship training and so on. But of course, the other reason why we think that it's often appropriate to send people to prison is because we think that prison represents justice. We think that some people deserve to go to prison, that we think they deserve punishment. And we think that sending people to prison 
shows that we are taking what they did seriously, that we recognise that it was wrong and we recognise that it mattered. And I think it's one thing to say that people might deserve to receive punishment, but I think there's another question, which is, where do we deserve to do punishment? Is dishing out pain, the pain and punishment that we know that imprisonment represents, something that we want the state to be in the business of doing deliberately? I think those are two conceptually different questions. And often when people say that prison is the answer, or that more prison, perhaps that's a better way of putting it, that more prison is the answer in serious cases, is the answer, they often say that this is the case because, they, because that must be what victims want, that victims want more prison. And I think we need to be really careful of ventriloquising for victims and assuming that we know what they want. I think there's a huge diversity amongst the population of victim survivors of sexual violence, but there has been research conducted by Claire McGlynn and Nicole Westmarland, uh, who are two academics at Durham University, about what does justice look like for victim survivors of gender-based violence. And what they found is that victim survivors of gender-based violence, on the whole, don't primarily want the person who hurt them to suffer for the sake of it. And actually, what they think justice is, isn't really that much to do with the person who hurt them at all. So McGlynn and Westmarland describe justice from the perspective of victims, survivors, as kaleidoscopic. And they think that justice means getting recognition, having the state and the community acknowledge that what was done to them was wrong. And I think conviction is part of that. They, want the they do want the perpetrator to face consequences. They don't want their life to continue as it was before. And in some cases, imprisonment under certain circumstances might be part of that. They want to be safe, and they want the community to be safe. They want dignity, and they want to have a voice in the process. So we know that the way the justice system works at the moment, the legal system works at the moment, is not good at providing dignity and a voice to victims of sexual violence. And I think there are ways of getting those things. I think our starting point should be how can we provide victims with the things that they consider to be justice that don't necessarily do the damage that prisons as they currently do them do. So we know that prisons, as we currently do them, increase the suicide rate. We know that prisons, as we, they, we, as we currently do them, increase rates of self-harm. We know that prisons, as, they, as we currently do them, uh, increase the rates of deaths from natural causes. So in terms of changes, if I've got time to list a couple of changes that I think we could make, a very small amount of time. Uh, in addition to investing much more in prevention, I also think that uh, one change that we could make, which I don't even think of as an alternative to the current justice system, but more as an addition, is better investment in restorative justice, even in cases of sexual violence. So historically, that's been considered quite controversial in cases of sexual violence um, for various reasons, including primarily the risk of re-traumatising victims. But increasingly, I think restorative justice practitioners and advocates and uh, feminist advocates are recognising that when it's done by well-trained <coughs> professionals, well-trained restorative justice facilitators, and on a timeline um, that makes sense to victims, that restorative justice can be a way that victim survivors can, uh, can get closer to what, get closer to meeting their, their own justice needs in the way McGlynn and Westmarland mentioned. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, and as Alice said, you know, thank you all for, for being here, particularly on, on so warm an afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr Jeff Page, as, as uh, Matt so kindly said, and I was very glad that there was all the dirt and filth in my biography, Matt, because it, it makes that a little bit in, more easy to walk into it again. Um, so I, I think if there's one core message for, for what I really want to say uh, throughout the next seven-ish minutes, hopefully, I'll set myself, myself a stopwatch, it's the importance of a sense of the social contract, right? And that is that if people do everything we ask of them, what can they realistically expect? What can you get if you behave perfectly, if you stop offending, if you put down drugs? And I think that's a really important question that, that we often don't think about uh, robustly enough. So to walk into my biography just a little bit, I mean, I, I was um, drug and alcohol dependent really from the age of 18 and, until 24. Uh, I was homeless for a bit. I was paranoid schizophrenic. I, I was detained in a secure psychiatric hospital and, and also hospitalised a couple of times with, with, um, with liver problems and, and approaching liver failure. So, so really uh, problems at, at that age. Um, but I think the other really important side of that is I was incredibly privileged as well. So I've been to private school. Uh, I had A-levels behind me. 
Um, and when my parents paid for me to go into the Priory, it's not that great, but it is the Priory, I was surrounded by um, cardiologists and um, diplomats and a chef and people who's you know, a minor shopping channel television presenter uh, and people with, with, with things behind them, right? I walked out of there knowing that I'd delivered Domino's Pizza for a few years and, and I had an employment history. I was able to walk into gardening, you know, in a, a Batley, Batley Private Loos, cleaning them anyway. But I was able to walk into a job. My day was full. I was able to go back to university within three months and uh, enter a criminology course, thanks to my A-levels, uh, and I'm still dining out on that today. So all the things that were a problem, you know, I can pitch, hey, look at me, look at all those things I've done, look at all the problems. And um, I was able to turn them into an asset. And I think that's a real problem because, um, you know, in, in the words of a 2013 paper, which I love to bits, I can tell tales of having met the devil himself and, and shook hands with the devil and returned to tell the tale. But it's, it's not generalisable. It's not all we're talking about, particularly when we're talking about drug-dependent prisoners. Uh, and when I was thinking about, you know, some of the people we met, I, I was reminded of, of a woman I met in um, a women's prison, perhaps quite obviously, uh, who told me that her father had started sexually assaulting her at the age of two and at the age of 36, before her most recent sentence, he was still kicking down the door to her flat and sexually assaulting her whenever he wanted. Um, I thought of the boy who we met in Wales, whose brother had introduced him to heroin at the age of nine, had dropped out of school at the age of 11 and, and had not been back since. He'd been in and out of prison and Young Offenders Institute. And when I look at the starting point that I had, the social contract that I had, you know, really drug dependent, whatever, you know, and the things that I could walk into, I think we need to ask a really important question. If we want to talk about rehabilitation, how can we get people to that kind of point, right? So tying this into some of the work that we did specifically around prisons, uh, the, the project that brought me to um, York was an evaluation of drug recovery wings. And these were a coalition government initiative, you may, may remember them from 2010, they set these up in 2013, and they wanted to encourage drug-dependent prisoners to live happy, productive, tax-paying, tax paying, you know, free and, and beneficial lives. And so they told 10 prisons that they could um, effectively uh, set up these wings. Do whatever you want, just get prisoners off drugs. And, and we went around and, and had a look at them. And all these prisoners were, in principle, drug-dependent. Uh, they were primarily in for non-violent offences, most of them in for short sentences, and I think there's definitely a, a debate in the criminological community about whether short sentences, six months, serve any value at all, just long enough to lose your relationships, your housing, your employment, everything, while serving no rehabilitative uh, opportunities. And even within prison, we saw the effect of, of social capital. We saw the effect of, of starting privilege. So the very first wing we walked into, it was full of buff old prisoners. I mean, they've been down the gym. They're looking quite healthy, right? They were, they were really quite sorted. And we walked around the wing. No one there had a history of heroin use. Not one, right? We're talking about drugs. Not one prisoner on that wing had a history of heroin use. Just next door, they had a stabilisation wing. 180 prisoners on methadone, all heroin dependent. Not one had gone onto that wing, right? And it had single cells. It had in-cell toilets. All the prisoners wanted to be there, so none of the low-status prisoners could get in, right? And all these prisoners, first, second offence, big old buff lads, they had histories of employment, they had families together on the outside. Uh, my mum's looking after my son, you know, I've got a gym in the garage, my old employer's keeping me going, I can go back into it when I come out, right? Uh, alcohol, cannabis, cocaine. And when we spoke to them six months later, that was what was happening. They'd stopped drug use sometimes, or they never really had a drug problem in the past. You know, they, they were living reasonably happy and fulfilled lives, doing whatever they had been done before and prison was a brief problem. We then went into a second wing where they targeted heroin users, and the wings were violent, chaotic, and disordered. And when I say that, I mean we had prisoners telling us that there were four dealers going around, cells of new prisoners, scooping out cavities with a spoon because they thought people were bringing drugs in, and very often they were. Um, there was no sense of anyone coming off drugs. And when we spoke to them, they said, I've been in prison all my life. All my adult life, I can't even count my sentences. I haven't spent a Christmas in the community since I was 18. No one talks to me. I know when I leave here, I'm going to be street homeless again. Why am I going to give up drugs? Why am I going to give that up? What's he going to do for me? And when we tried to find them six months later, and of course we could only find the more orderly and together ones because the others had disappeared beyond any attempt at finding them. Um, we had stories like a, a, a young lad who had given up um, prescribed opioids, had been sold a dream of living an abstinence and drug-free, happy life, tax-paying, etc. Uh, he'd come out, he'd found that he was street homeless, briefly found a place in a 
hostile, he was seriously mentally ill, uh, and he returned to cocaine dealing. And on the day I met him, he'd just been released from hospital, having thrown himself under a car in his third suicide attempt in six months. Uh, we had another lad who uh, was alcohol dependent, history of uh, domestic violence. He told us again that he was really street homeless, and we heard these narratives time and time and time and time again. Uh, and again, when we look at this, um, you know, what, what we hear time and time again is that people are released with no hope. They have nowhere to go. They have no way of reintegrating into society. We, we didn't speak to a single person who had been found decent, safe, or stable housing. Even when we spoke to units where they're trying to get people off drugs, they weren't found housing, they weren't found employment, if they're told... We'll link you up with a scheme to get a builder's labouring card. Those schemes just didn't come through. Uh, there's a scheme in Home House Prison just north of here where they're training people to work on the maintenance of windmills to generate electricity. There were no jobs in renewables around Home House. So there were people coming out and again being street homeless. And we had this persistent sense of failure uh, and things not coming through. So when we think about alternatives, what can we really do? And, and there's this part of me that, that pulls towards uh, the, these fundamental tinkering at the edges, pragmatic solutions. We have things like home detention curfew, where we can release people a quarter of the way through their sentence. Uh, and in principle, we could, for example, release people to residential rehabs. You have to stay in residential rehab. If you're really committed, there are windows of opportunity sometimes. People sometimes want to do it. Let's say you release to residential rehab, that's your designated address. If you leave that address, you go back to prison, right? We could, in principle, do that. Then you're in residential rehab instead of prison. It kind of works. Um, if you look at the fact that historically, Eton has cost, I don't know if that's still the case, uh, Eton has historically been cheaper than YOIs, Young Offenders Institutes. I mean, YOIs have become cheaper, Eton has become more expensive. But you look in the difference in the way we treat young people. And I can tell you this, I've never felt my soul so crushed and desolate as walking out of Brinsford Young Offenders Institute. Young learning disabled people, not knowing what they've done, not understanding the rules in an environment of bullying, intimidation and horror. It was, anyway, horrendous. So we, we can talk about those things, right? Hey, let's look at Eton, let's look at residential. I, I think more broadly, if I'm going to speak aspirationally, say the things that get people there are community, love, belonging, trust, chances, inclusion. And all of that is about so much more than anything statutory services can do. So Michael Ignatieff, last little bit, wrote a book in 1984 saying, called The Needs of Strangers, saying, how can you, how can you pay a social worker, no offence, to, to deliver love? When we talk to people who've been in treatment for 20 years, heroin treatment, they say, I've told people my life story 20 times. They're on to their next job in 10 years. I put my heart into this. They're gone because it's their career, it's my life. And I think we have all those questions that, that you know, if, if I'm going to speak from the heart, what, what do we need to look at? How can we include people? How can we lift them up so that when they leave prison, we're not just talking about holistic treatment, meaning we'll point you to a housing worker and a debts worker. We're talking about inclusion, community, love, trust and belonging. I don't know the pathways to be there, but really, if we're talking about re rehabilitation, we need to get people to that point. Thank you very much. And Justin. Thank, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, Justin Russell, Chief Inspector of uh, Probation. For those of you who don't know much about what we do, we are, the shorthand term is basically the Ofsted of the Probation Service. So we travel around England and Wales uh, inspecting and rating local probation services, and we do the same thing for youth justice services. In, uh, local councils as well um, and we also do national thematic inspections on particular topics and we quite often do those with colleagues from the prisons inspectorate uh, Ofsted and the, and the uh, CPS inspectorate um, so for example since I've become chief inspectors we've done important thematics on drugs on services for people with a drug problem on probation uh, mental health um, accommodation we've been looking at race as well increasingly over the past uh, few years and I'll say a bit about what, what we found in that. We've done a couple of really important thematics recently on the services available for people uh, before release from prison uh, and whether they're getting the support that they need after release from prison. The, the, the question we were asked was do, do prisons work? Taking that question very narrowly and I think people working in the prison service would say well Actually, one of our functions is to deliver the orders of the court. If someone's sentenced to custody, we have to hold that person securely and safely until the end of the custodial part of their sentence. Certainly in terms of the secure bit, they're quite successful. There was one escape from prison, I think, last, last year. There might have been 10 from prison escorts. Less convinced that they're holding people safely. There are appalling problems of self-harm 
uh, in all parts of the prison uh, estate. And there was a big problem with assaults as well, both prisoner on prisoner and prisoner against staff, which thankfully has come, come down a bit, but is still far too high. But I think when we talk about do prisons work, we don't really mean those things. We mean do prisons prepare people for life after release. And I think, Matt, as you were saying, that is part of the mission statement of the service. And in terms of that mission, they're not doing a great job. And I think that's what both we and colleagues in the prisons inspectorate are finding in our local inspections and our national thematics. I want to talk about two reasons why I think prisons aren't working at the moment to support people for life after release. One is the, is the nature of prisons themselves, the way they are designed, the populations that are holding, which gets in the way of effective work to rehabilitate and, and support people after release. And then the second issue, which is something we've been very focused on, is the support that's provided, the continuity of services that are provided to people after they are released. So on that first point is, does the current structure and nature of the prison estate support people to, to lead better lives after release? I mean, we've, we've heard a lot about the size of the prison population, and it is at an acute point at, at the moment. The prison population has increased about 5,000 just in the last year, Alone, it's up about 7,500 since the, the lockdown during the pandemic. It, it really is a, a difficult point, I think, as people have been saying, the projections are that it will increase. On the, This is the mid-range projection. It will get to 94,000 by 2025. And in practice, it's been like that for a long time now. The prison population hit 80,000 in the mid-2000s, and apart from that brief period during the lockdown, it hasn't come down below that, and it's been closer to 85,000 for a, a long period of time. But the interesting thing is, even within that population of 80 to 85,000, there's been some really significant changes in who the nature of who's in prison, particularly the sentenced population. In particular, we've been a big increase in the number of people being held on longer sentences. There's 20,000 more people being held on sentences over four years than there were 30 years ago. And a big reduction, actually, in the people on short sentences. So <clears throat> 10 years ago, there were eight, eight, about 8,000 people on a sentence under 12 months. It's now only 3,500. So I completely agree with what we've been hearing today. It would be good to try and get, uh, get rid of that short sentence population. But in practice, that only knocks 4% off the total prison population. So you've got a much bigger set of the population that are serving much longer sentences. The, the number of people serving mandatory life sentences has, has, has doubled. And the proportion of people in prison who have committed a, a violent or a sex offence has gone up from a third about 20, 30 years ago to nearly a, a half now. That's a really quite a profound change just in the space of 20 years. It's a huge change from what the world looked like in the Victorian era when many of our prisons were were built. I don't know if people know about the history of the prison service, but we didn't, didn't used to actually be longer-term prison sentences until the late uh, 19th century. If you committed a more serious offence uh, in Victorian times, <coughs> you were transported to the colonies or you were hung, basically. That was it. Um, there weren't, prison was for short sentence for people who were debtors, basically. Debtors prison, the classic sort of Charles Dickens situation. Transportation was abolished. They brought in longer prison sentences, um, but they were only four-year sentences, and that, a big part of our estate is designed to hold people for short prison sentences. They're never designed to hold people for 15, 20-year life tariffs. So there, there is a huge issue about having a prison estate that's actually fit for purpose to, to hold people who are serving those longer sentences. And I th I'm afraid that means we've got to spend some more money on prisons. I'm, it might not be a popular thing to say, but we do need to invest in the prison service. We do need to build new prison places, just to give you an idea, just to get rid of overcrowding in the prison system, which is a terrible problem at the moment. You'd need to build 10,000 more prison places to, just to get rid of overcrowding, and you'd need to build them in the right places um, as well. So we have a real issue with the, the, the shape and nature of our prison estate, which just isn't fit for purpose in terms of a, of a long-term sentence popu population, and that does mean spending more money uh, on prisons, I think, going, going forward. So the sentence population, that's one of the reasons why the, the population is going up. But there are some other big drivers of the population that have nothing to do with sentencing policy, but are to do with things that I think we could do something about. So the two biggest drivers over the past year have actually been 
number of people being held on remand, so they're waiting for a trial or they're waiting to be sentenced, that's up 15%. There's 15,000 people now in prison waiting to be sentenced or waiting for <coughs> trial and almost no services for that group. They are actually left out of the contracts for resettlement support. I think people might have forgotten that they may need support for after they were released. Um, and that is hugely affected by the court backlogs, which we heard about this morning from, from Joanna. The Crown Court backlogs has, has <coughs> doubled in five years, so over 60,000 people waiting for a Crown Court trial. And then the second big growth area over the past year has been people who are being recalled back to prison. So they've been released at the halfway point of their sentence and they've been brought back into prison because it was felt that their risk was increasing. That, that group within the prison population is up by 21%. And a big reason that that's happening is about the quality of work of the probation service with that group after they're leaving. And just to, to, to finish off with, just to quickly tell you about some work we've been doing on, on that issue around resettlement support after release. We, last year, we followed up a group of 100 prisoners from um, when they were in prison at the beginning of last year to after release from custody in the autumn of last year. And we found a very concerning situation. We found 60% of those that group had been released without settled accommodation. 10% were literally street homeless at the point that they were um, released. A big chunk of them, and like Jeff was saying, had a, a drugs problem before they went into prison. Less than a quarter of them had had any help with that drugs problem after they were released. Uh, only 6% of them had a job to go to after they were released. So those real basics about sorting your accommodation out, sort of finding your job, <coughs> giving you help with a drug problem, just weren't being dealt with. And as a result, 30% of that sample we looked at had been recalled back to prison, and it was nearly half in some of the areas. And the reason they were being recalled wasn't necessarily because they committed uh, another offence. It was because they had um, no accommodation, they'd gone back onto drugs, they'd lost contact with their probation officer, and to be on the safe side, they'd been uh, taken back into, into custody. So one of the really urgent priorities, and one thing that could really help reduce the pressure on the population, is, is to do with all those things, to properly resource the probation service to make sure people are getting accommodation after release, that they are being linked up to drug services, that they're being help, uh, given help to find uh, employment. And we're a long way off being able to do that. A big reason for that is uh, the workloads that probation under at the moment. 55% of the probation staff that we interview say that they think their caseloads are unmanageable. Very big vacancies in the probation service and in the prison service too, actually, which are hampering all of that. So just, just finally, some three, three things that I think would need to be, need to be done <coughs> in, the, in the short to medium term. We do need to revive the use of community sentences. There's been the, 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 a huge reduction in the, in the number of community orders being given out by the courts. They've come down by about half in the last 10 years. So restoring <coughs> sentence of confidence in, in uh, community sentences is an important thing to do. But we need to be realistic that that isn't really going to shift the prison population down that much. We need to, as I've been saying, properly support people after they've come out of prison with the basics around an income, around accommodation, around all the things that we've been talking about. And we do need to invest uh, in prisons. We need, we need to create new, new places. We need to create humane prisons that do support people after release, rather than keeping people in the sort of squalid conditions that I'm afraid we're having to see at the moment. Great. Thank you very much. So perhaps, perhaps I could start by asking to what degree you think we can generalise. I mean, in, in a way, Alice, you, you made the point that the, the kinds of offenders you've been looking at through your research are a very different group um, in age profile, probably in education profile, um, probably in class and all the rest of it. So is, can, can we have a prison policy that is general, or do we need, and, and a, sorry, a release and a post-prison policy that's general, or do we need to sort of be more specific for different needs, whether that's drug needs or because of the, 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 the offender profile? Do you want me to start? You, wait, wait, you. <laughs> um, I was hoping someone else would, <laughs> would start while I get my thoughts in order. I would say, yes, I mean, I think we absolutely, absolutely need... Um, 
prison and post-release policy which is responsive to individual people and individual situations. Um, I think the, the group that I'm most aware of is people convicted of sex offences, and you're right that the, that group there are, are demographically different to people serving sentences for other offences. Um, so that people are, you know, there is a, I would say the mean, the mean person in prison for a sex offence has uh, more formal education, has a higher income, there's less racial disproportionality, etc. That doesn't mean that there aren't people serving sentences for sex offences who have had you know, extremely difficult backgrounds, time and care, homelessness, learning difficulties, no education or whatever. It's more that I think that there is, uh, that kind of middle and upper class people are more likely to kind of be included in that group than otherwise. But I think, so I think absolutely the justice system, um, we need to, needs to respond um, to the people and the needs that they have that they are dealing with. But I actually think that we need to take one step back and our starting point shouldn't be um, how can the prison and post-release system respond to this individual, but it should be what do we actually want to do? We've got a problem, we've got a social problem, we've got a, a serious harm or wrong has been committed or something very bad has happened. And what do we want to do? We want to make things safer, we want to change this person's trajectory, we want to create justice. And it might be that sometimes prison is, is a way of getting to those needs, but I think it needs to be seen as one of a repertoire mm -hmm. of tools rather than the kind of starting tool that you then fiddle with to make it more effective for the individual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so, I, yeah, Justin. So well, I think one of, the, one of the key roles of the probation service is to do exactly as you're saying and work out what the individualised or personalised needs of someone coming out of prison are. Um, in an ideal world, they would do that several, quite a few months before release, mm -hmm. actually, and there are, there are a system in place that is supposed to make sure people get that pre-release assessment, and then that's handed over to someone uh, in the community. But we're finding, because of the caseloads and the workloads that people, probation officers in the community are, they haven't got the time to go and visit people in prison or to do those assessments properly. So quite often the uh, releases are happening uh, without uh, adequate assessment. And then once someone comes out, again, the quality of assessment isn't nearly as good as it, as it should be. Um, and things are being missed, or even more worryingly, where, when needs are being identified, so when an alcohol or drugs problem is identified, or a mental health need, or a uh, need around, uh, uh, around families or, or anger management issues, there isn't actually a service then to meet that needs. And probably only about half, well, less than half of the cases we're inspecting, we're finding those needs are being met uh, in, in the plans that are being set out. So absolutely, it has to be very specific to the needs of the person being uh, released, but we're finding those needs aren't, really aren't being uh, met at the moment. So I'll, I'll, question for you, Justin, and you, Jeff, and then I'll ask Angela about alternatives and, and, and Norway. Norway is always held up. As a, I mean, so I suppose, Justin, and the question for you is, this looks mad, doesn't it? I mean, we are, I don't know whether it's still true, but it, it certainly used to be true that we would often release people from prison on a Friday when services are closed on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. And my understanding was with something like 73 pounds, which is meant to be the amount of money to get them from where they are on that Friday to when universal credit kicks in. The government's own statistics for that period of time is at least three weeks. Now, £73 doesn't get you through three weeks. It does, in a memorable phrase of a criminologist called Chad Maruna, it's not enough for rent, but it's exactly enough to score. So we are, we are setting people up to fail, a lot of people up to fail, and that just seems insane. I mean, it, so, so the first question, in a sense, to you, Justin, is why is it that, that the people who fund this, the government and so on, Faced with that obvious thought that if you drop someone off in a city centre with 73 quid on a Friday, the chances of them reoffending, the chances of them getting back with their old friends, back in, into drugs, are going to be very high, and so mm -hmm. recidivism is going to go up. And that's expensive, mm -hmm. more expensive than providing them with services. So I guess that's the question. <laughs> I'm not expecting you to answer on behalf of politicians, but I suppose just to reflect on that. But then to come to Jeff, I mean... Jeff, in a way, I mean, you said what's obviously true, which is people need more than just social services. They need more than just a social worker or more than just a drug program. They need trust. They need 
all of those sort of social capital things that, that many of us take for granted. Um, but how, I mean, is that a realistic vision? I mean, because often their social capital will be of not very high quality. You know, getting back with their friends would actually be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And so how do you envisage a, a post-release world that works better? And then I'll give you time to think, Angela. You know, as it were, have you come across examples of how a post-release world might work better? Well, I mean, I mean, you're right. What, what, what is expected from people being released is just overwhelming. You, you're released on a Friday. You're expected to go and see your probation officer on the same day. If you haven't got any housing, you're expected to go to the local council housing office to wait and get them to sort out emergency accommodation. You might have to go and see a bank manager to get a bank account opened. You, you will need to sort out your universal credit claim and hopefully get an advance on, on that if you, if you can. And all of that, and you may have haven't been outside for 10, 15 years. So that, that, that support on, the, in, on day one and week one in terms of the practical things that need to be sorted out, I think, is, is sorely lacking and should be an absolute priority to, to, um, to sort out. There has been one of the lessons from lockdown was that, even worse, people were being released into the middle of a lockdown from prison without any accommodation about it. And so I think at least at that point, the, the service recognised, well, no, we have to do something about this. And there, there was emergency accommodation arrangements put in place around the country which would pay for I think it was up to three months worth of emergency housing thankfully that's now been continued after the pandemic and has been rolled out to five areas so the probation service can now sort out emergency accommodation for I think up to 86 days query what happens after the 86 days if you haven't sorted out a longer term uh, lease or, or rental arrangement for something and that's still a bit a big issue but yeah, I mean, it, that, that, the reason people come out on Friday is because if your sentence finishes on Saturday or Sunday, the, the, the only other option would be to hold you until Monday past the end of your sentence expiry date. So that, you know, there is a rational reason for it, but it doesn't make things easier if you're coming out the day before if mm. everything closes for the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff? Um, I, I think what I'm proposing is entirely undeliverable, and, and there's no <laughs> sense in which it, it could realistically be achieved. But I, I think there are... There are there are real difficulties with systems thinking and, and there are real difficulties with processes and, and I don't mean this is a criticism of a probation in any sense, but we have the language of needs met, for example, and what does it mean to have your needs met? You know, that, that's quite a profound statement in many ways, but, but what we mean is, is that we've provided something that, that means we can say your housing need has, has been addressed, for example. Um, whilst we were doing our evaluation of, of drug recovery wings and, and shortly after, Rory Stewart, who some of you may remember as, as the Minister for Prisons, um, surprised quite a lot of civil servants by making a rogue announcement that he was going to reduce violence and drug use in, in 10 key prisons, uh, and no one knew how they were going to do it. You know? So he was like, you know, I'm going to resign if I can't deliver reduced drug use, reduced violence within these 10 uh, really problematic prisons within, um, within a year. Uh, and we went to one of those which we've been working on, on drug recovery wings, They've been given £8 million to become the uh, foundational drug recovery prison. And what have they done? They've made the walls higher, they've put in airport security scanners, they've improved security. They've, and I remember saying to the, the regional uh, lead for norms, you know, why didn't you buy £8 million worth of housing? You know, if, if you want to get people off drugs, you know, it's not that you need airport scanners and more dogs walking the perimeter. It's that you're releasing people to fundamentally unsafe and unsecure housing surrounded by other people who are heavily drug dependent. And I think, you know, that there is, there is this discontinuous thinking. There is a lack of, con you know, we think we've got prisoners. We think we've got prisoners and these people are called prisoners. And so we try and get them off drugs. That is absolutely dysfunctional. When you look at someone who's street homeless, who has covered in abscesses, who has no engagement with primary health, you're trying to get him off treatment and or off medication. The only reason you can do that is because you can forget he's homeless, uh, unsupported by any meaningful services, etc. the minute he's released, because he looks like a prisoner. He looks like in a, he's in a stable place. So I think there's this real discontinuity in prison. Um, I think from my perspective... Uh, yeah, and what does it mean, for example, when we say that someone has their drug treatment meets, meets, needs met? We don't know what we're doing in drug treatment. We don't. We've got a persistent problem with crack users. We can't offer them anything. We know that crack is a problem. It's really great for taking your problems away for 10 minutes and then you want more. Really great for taking away your problems for 10 minutes and then you want more. It's so incredibly effective at killing pain for 10 minutes and then you want more. Um, we've got no Which treatment for <laughs> 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 Depends on your social capital, but anyway. Um, so, 
what, we can't give them methadone. We, we're really good at people give, keeping people engaged with heroin treatment. Could we give them this drug that then they withdraw from horrendously if they stop using it? We've got nothing for crack. We can't treat you for it, really. We've seen this since 2006, 7 when I was working in services. We'll assess you for crack need so you can come to full-time day treatment or nothing, then be surprised when you don't turn up at full-time day treatment, because it's 10 years before you've got a minimum wage job working in the drug sector. There's no, there's no hope. So in principle, we can tick a box by saying a need is met, and I really don't mean that cynically, because it's better than having no need met. But, but the substantive engagement to getting people to a better place is so much more than we, we are currently able to envisage or deliver within statutory services. You know, that box for crack, it's non-existent. You know, someone who's engaged with crack treatment can see the nodding because we just don't know what to do with it. All we can do is sit you down in a room and tell you crack is really bad. It's not actually, I mean, it you know, does the job. Crack is really bad, your life will be better. Well, it will in 10 years. It's not a great sales pitch, it really isn't. So I think you know, it's undeliverable, but there are problems within the systems that mean we're never going to have a broader effect until we think about love, belonging, trust, engagement, etc. Those are, those are the things that get people better. Angela, Angela cheer us up. I'm going to um, do my best. I'll start with the depressing stuff. I set up and ran a through the gate service from prison out to a London borough. So I had to go through the gate with people on Fridays. And they didn't usually even get released till midday on a Friday because the prison regime was too chaotic. There were code blues going off. The governor couldn't sign the paperwork. So I had from 12 o'clock to get from one side of London to the other with a man to go and pick up his methadone script for the weekend. To get to his probation officer, the appointment was at one o'clock, but we're never going to make that on time. I had to ring them because the probation officer didn't trust that he was being honest. And then we had to try and find some housing as well. And there were so many times I had to leave men at the end of my shift not knowing if there was going to be a roof over their head. And I think one of, the, one of the kind of arguments against this let's house people, let, let's give them these foundations is this argument, but what about the good upstanding members of society? They don't have housing either. They don't have support either. And this is what I'm talking about when we're kind of pitting people against each other, this kind of race to the bottom of like who deserves support. Um, so the cheerful stuff then. <laughs> Everyone holds up Norway as being brilliant. Norway's prisons, bloody hell, they're good. Um, they, are, they are very good inside. Norway doesn't do everything perfectly. It really, really doesn't. They've got some really big issues um, with their harm reduction, with their intravenous drug use, that kind of thing. But what they do do incredibly well is have this continuity of care from community to the prison and back again. So people like me who worked inside prison, if you're in Norway, I'd be the same person you'd see inside prison as when you get released. They also have such um, better engagement with families coming in and out of prison because we know that keeping those social relationships allow people to reduce their reoffending when they get released. Um, they have work opportunities and, you know, we talk about, as you say, ticking these boxes of in prison people, has he been in employment whilst in prison? We're talking about mopping landings, we're talking about doing sewing courses. We're not talking about building the skills for a, a 21st century economy. Our prisons don't even have kind of technology in them at the moment. There's plenty of people going out after long sentences who've not used the internet. And we think we're equipping people for a job market by giving them skills in mopping and sewing. So I think there's this real continuity of the colleges out in the communities in Norway. Um, they are the ones that provide the college courses within custody. And again, you can continue doing your qualification if you haven't finished upon release. And, and it, I think, as you're saying, it, it comes back to this idea of, of community and the idea of not kind of pitting ourselves against, well, they don't deserve the help, I should get the help. I think if we want our communities to be stronger, we have to invest in this and we have to step back from from the kind of emotionality of wanting to punish people. We shouldn't make policy based on emotions. We should make policy based on evidence and data and do what works based on evidence and data. And it might not feel good in the moment that the evidence and data shows we need to be compassionate, but that's what works and that's what we need to do. Can I say something yeah. about Norway? Um, because I, uh, I entirely agree with everything that you just said. I used to work on a project that was comparing prisoners' experiences in England and Wales and Norway. Um, and it wasn't so much about outcomes, it wasn't really about what happened, you know, did, it wasn't really about reducing reoffending, or it wasn't about um, 
all of that type of stuff directly. It was about what is the experience like of being in prison primarily. And, and uh, the main thing that we found, our argument was that uh, Norwegian prisons damage much less than England prisons in England and Wales. So it's not just that they do great stuff that they do in terms of education and employment and uh, this thing called normalisation, the idea that people in prison um, have the same rights as people outside other than being in prison, um, but they also just damage less. And one way why they do that, one one uh, way in which they do that is that prisons are much more porous in all sorts of ways. So people from all sorts of external agencies go in much more. That's family members as well as organisations. And also people in prison go out much more. Um, so even in high security prisons in Norway, people might go for a walk in the woods or in the you know plentiful Norwegian countryside in a supervised and safe way. So they're much less. Um, obsessed with the kind of the physicality of the wall and that element of security and they also make much much better use of open prisons yeah. um, and uh, we did as part of that study we did a survey of prisoners in 13 prisons in England and Wales and Norway over a thousand responses um, and what this survey found is that surprise surprise Norway was doing better than England and Wales on every dimension um, but a lot of that difference was explained statistically by the fact that in Norway, in fact, all, I think almost all of that difference was explained statistically by the fact that in Norway they have much greater use of open prisons and their open prisons are better than ours. So in an average year, 5% of our prison population will spend some time in open. In Norway, in an average year, 65% of the prison population will spend some time in open. Um, and they also send different people to open prisons. So because we have so few open prisons, it's primarily used for people at the end of long sentences um, in England and Wales. Um, not, not right now because of uh, bad things that Dominic Raab has done, which uh, Dame Anne talked about earlier. But the idea of what our idea for what open prisons should be for is a, kind of a testing ground slash transition point for people on long sentences. In Norway, they've served that function as well, but in, they're also the place where we send people, where they send people serving short sentences. So no one in England and Wales goes straight to open. You only go there once you've been tested in, um, in, a, in another prison. And with people sending short sentences, and I, I agree that we should get rid of short sentences, but it's extra, an extra level of madness about short sentences is that we take people who are serving the shortest sentences for the crimes that we therefore consider to be least serious and then put them in the worst prisons. Um, and in Norway, they put them in the best prisons. And of course, that is less damaging. And of course, it is mu they are much more able to um, uh, retain the context, contacts that they need or build the context that they need to be able to build successful lives when they get out. So one, one suggestion is more open prisons. That's my suggestion. Can I just add one really quick point? I think we've, we've all kind of mentioned a little bit this idea of like reintegration into communities and a lot of the time I think we're talking about people who haven't felt integrated or haven't been integrated ever in our communities um, and I think that's a really interesting point and this is where I'm kind of saying it's not actually about prison, it's about funding our community services and putting money into, we've mentioned Sure Start, things like this and creating a sense of community because when you have a sense of community and belonging you don't necessarily want to commit crimes against the other people in your communities as well i, I want to leave plenty of time for the <laughs> audience so i'm going to move across to the audience i'll just make one autobiographical comment which is that i spent 28 years of my life as a philosopher of punishment and thinking about punishment and i always have Every night I more or less go to bed and think, but Matt, you know the answer. The answer has nothing to do with punishment. It's to do with primary school, the sure start, welfare yeah. systems, yeah. and so on. But, um, but we all have to do something. <laughs> right. So I'm very, very keen that, that, that we do have enough time. So let's take some questions. Uh, yeah, the lady here in the red. And please wait for the microphone. And then um, we'll go right up to where you are. There's a gentleman right at the back. Hi, um, I'm going to be joining the prison service in September with the Unlocked Graduate Scheme. So I'm going to be working up in, I think someone mentioned Weatherby earlier on, um, so that's where I'm going to be based. Um, I was just wondering what your kind of view is of the key worker system that's kind of come into place. You know, I think in, in theory it's a really good idea that you've got this one kind of contact who's going to get to know you while you're in there and stuff like that. Um, but in actuality, I mean, I think the guidelines are 
you know, recommended 45 minutes a week? You know, how can you start to understand someone for 45 minutes a week? So do you think the actual idea of a key worker in itself is a good idea and it's just the way in which we're carrying it out? Or do you think that the idea of having it in the first place is probably not the best way of dealing with things? Great, thank you. Who wants to pick that up? Justin? Well, I mean, first of all, it's great that you're going to join the prison service. Yeah. I think, you know, well done for, for doing that. They, they really need people um, at the moment. We, we actually looked at this issue of key workers in that thematic study that I mentioned, and prison inspector colleagues um, talked to, uh, talk to key workers. Um, we worked with an organisation called User Voice who talked to prisoners about their experience of key workers. And it, it wasn't positive, to be honest with you. The prisoners told us that they'd only seen a key worker a couple of times in the previous six months prison officers told us they'd like they'd like the idea of key work but they kept getting taken off to other wings to to cover for absent colleagues and that meant they couldn't do the weekly contacts that they were supposed to be doing and the pandemic did real damage to the key worker system because of well because of lockdown it meant they couldn't see prisoners but it also meant people were having to to go off wing and, and do other tasks so it really isn't working as it was supposed to be and it was a, a crucial core component of the bid that the prison service put in for two and a half thousand extra staff the, the business case justifying that was about we're going to deliver key workers and everyone's going to get a, a key worker session every week and they're, they're a long way off delivering that I think the, the, the model is too rigid I don't think actually having a one size fits all everyone sees everyone once a week is necessarily the best way to, best way to go um, I think you need a bit more flexibility. Some people may need some more attention. Some, particularly if they're on a very long sentence, to, to have someone talk about, are you ready for release 20 years before you're going to be released, it isn't actually going to help you very much. It may actually be counterproductive, I think. So I think our, one of our recommendations would be uh, think a bit more flexibly about how that key worker model is, uh, is applied in practice. OK, anyone else? We, we, we came across the, a key worker system kind of 2014, 2015, which... It used to be called something else, I think, yeah. But personal officers. Personal, yeah. personal officers, yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and again, I mean, yeah. it's, it's reassuring to hear everything you say because, yeah. again, that, that, was, that was very much our experience. It's great to hear you going into the prison service. I think when we were going in, what we were hearing from prisoners is, is those issues around staffing, issues around when you're short staff, people were pulled off wings, and again, a sense from <coughs> in, in the older system that those problems were, were very much those that characterised the, the, um, the, what was it? The personal officer system back then. Yeah. So yeah. it'd be great if key works have broken it. But, um, great. Can we have really? the gentleman at the back, please? Thank you. I was wondering about to what extent the non statutory um, voluntary sector, public health, local authority, public health fill some of the gaps around rehabilitation of offenders and around helping people who are perhaps drug and alcohol dependent once they're back in the so-called community. I wonder to what extent that, that, that the gap is filled by voluntary and non-statutory agencies. Thank you. Um, just, just from, um, I don't know the, statistically what it is, but from my experience, um, if someone is on a methadone prescription, that will be provided. It will usually be, uh, local authority will be in charge of that, but it will have been tendered out to a third sector um, place. But the people who do the meet at the gates, the people who come and collect people as they're walking through the gates when there are drug dealers waiting on the other side of the road or they're being released with other people who are, who are perhaps a bad influence, it's usually the, the voluntary sector that pick that up and pick that kind of work up and get people um, on that train ride from the prison gate to the, to the methadone appointment. And I think those are the things that the, the voluntary sector really do pick up um, yeah, anything to... Yeah. I mean, I, th I think the, um, the prison and probation service have actually got about £200 million worth of contracts with external organisations to deliver various support services, including accommodation advice, wellbeing advice, dependency and recovery advice, specialist services for women. About two-thirds of those contracts have gone to the voluntary mm -hmm. sector and, and a higher proportion for women's services. But, but we found that the contracts themselves are pretty rigid. They'd all been determined nationally rather than allowing local areas to decide how they wanted that relationship to work. And they tended to freeze out the smaller voluntary organisations that couldn't compete for these big regional contracts. Um, and uh, as a result, the probation service, uh, probation staff we spoke to weren't finding them particularly uh, 
helpful, with the exception actually of women's services, where I think that there, there was a better job being done. So I think there's, there's definitely room, for, there's, there's a huge role that they could be playing, but it could be done in a much more effective and local and devolved way, I think. And, and I think with that, with this kind of tendering process, if you're working in the voluntary sector that's getting government contracts, your job kind of becomes every 18 months just reapplying for funding. Your focus becomes, are we ticking the boxes for funding? Which means if someone really needs help, is asking for help and wants it, but they have a crack problem, not a heroin problem, you can't work with that person. Or you can, but it's taking time away from the thing that will give you funding in the next round of funding. So I, there's no nuance whatsoever, and your job becomes very precarious if you work in the voluntary sector. You're kind of always not sure if you're going to be there in 18 months' time or not as well, which I think is very problematic. This is, this is part of the reason I'm no longer... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely chaotic management. But also, you know, we, we were early days of New Labour, actually not, not that early. Um, but, but we found that, that in the first contracting and, and retendering process, the whole management of the organisation fell apart. There was a big discussion uh, around that time around uh, additionality. So historically, when, when you look at the services that, you know, in my own field, drug providers sprang up to provide, they were locally grounded, they were innovative, they were locally targeted, they were often slightly eccentric, but they were very much additional. They were people doing stuff they believed in. So uh, the agency I worked in, it was a local woman recovering from alcohol dependence. Her two kids were heroin dependent. She really believed in 12-step. You know, my, my addictions counselling organisation, eight and a half, nine and a half addictions counsellors, all of us 12-step, all of us singing hallelujah, all of us kind of really, you know, banging that mission. We had a really um, idiosyncratic, you know, we, we were really delivering something additional. And let's talk about when you become dependent on government funding, when you become dependent on those contracts, you have to deliver the thing that the government wants you to do. So if you look at our local prescribing service, I should say drug service, but I think of it as a prescribing service, because its mainstay is, is really heroin, you know, that, that's the group who keeps on coming back. Uh, then, then you're contracted to deliver a certain amount of work with a certain amount of people with a certain amount of problems. Under the coalition government, they said, we want you to get everyone off drugs. That didn't work at all. Uh, so you have people manipulating statistics. Then they say, we want everyone back on a script because everyone's dying. Um, and, and so you see that this additionality, the ability to deliver innovative work, I think the women's sector is actually a real standout here because there's a really strong group of agencies since Corson and beyond with really clear models of local delivery and a really strong networked aspect. But I think the additionality has been lost um, in, in many other sectors. I do think we still see some really interesting and pioneering work. So, for example, you may or may not have heard of Housing First. It's an initiative that says... We don't care what you're doing, we're going to house you. You don't have to put down drugs first, you don't have to be engaged with mental health treatment, just come along, we'll house you, right? And, and because we think housing comes first. So again, the, these kind of initiatives that, that do spring up, I think can often show that the, the real value of additionality, and very often when you're in those frontline services, you, you meet the people who care and who are really um, engaging with a heart who want to make the difference. Very last thing I'm going to say, sorry, I'm, I'm really waffling on on this one. Um, is that a couple of years back, there was a, a huge review of drugs, the, the Dame Carol Black Review of Drugs, uh, kind of covering everything that said, you know, way too many people are dying, we've got a huge problem, austerity has crippled services, we need loads more money. Uh, we, we've put loads more money, in principle, back into drug treatment. I think it's £550 million over about four or five years, something like that. The problem we now find, because uh, I evaluated some of this work in, in the community, loads of this has gone into... Uh, criminal justice drug services, loads of it has gone into uh, many of the services that have disappeared. The problem is that drugs work is now low status and you find people cannot recruit with the amount of money they had. So many areas had an additional 10 to 20% of their budget. They could not fill them with staff because no one wants to work in drug services anymore. It's seen as low status, you're competing with social work, you're competing with health care, where there's reliability, where your contract isn't going to disappear in a year. Um, one of the national agencies we spoke to, huge, they commissioned something like a third of the sites in the UK. They had 370 posts, I think, still going when we spoke to them after six months. You can't fill the posts, and that's a real problem around value, around additionality. You look at Oxford, you can't buy a house. You can't, you can't live anywhere there if, if you, you're employed by uh, a third sector agency. So that there's real problems there around what we're valuing, the work we're valuing, it, and who's doing it. So... A series of splurged answers, sorry, but, but they do. <laughs> okay, we'll take a question here, please. 
And please just raise your hand so if I can... So throughout the talks today, we've focused a lot on measures pre-sentencing and post-sentencing, and those seem really important for rehabilitation. But I'm curious more about what happens in the prison, what sort of therapies and interventions are offered. Um, and specifically, it's quite interesting that a lot of the things that have been mentioned during this talk are trauma-informed, person-centered, and empowerment, and that's all quite similar to treatment that victims get following crimes. Um, I was wondering about what the therapies are like for offenders in prisons and how similar or different these are to what victims get. Oh, no, you go. Okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of therapies and interventions, I think um, I can speak to kind of violence and sexual offending cases and I'll let the others speak to drugs. Um, uh, there are definitely kind of programmes that we run for people in prison, interventions, often informed by cognitive behavioural principles that you think might, um, and sometimes kind of psychotherapeutic principles that we think might uh, reduce people's reoffending. So in the sex offending sphere, there used to be a programme called the Sex Offender Treatment Programme. There's now programmes called Horizon or Kaizen. Um, these are normally done in groups of kind of 10-ish people led by a trained facilitator and people talk about um, changes that they want to go through. Um, the issue with these programmes is that they are, um, is that uh, they're not hugely well evaluated. So the SOTP ran for a very long time uh, and then eventually an evaluation came out that showed it was... Um, was not reducing sexual offending and in some cases, and it can, this can be overstated, but, and it is sometimes overstated, but in some cases it was increasing reoffending. So after, they had that evaluation for a few years before they got rid of the SOTP, but they did. And now um, uh, they're running other courses that are supposed to be reducing reoffending, but the eval you know, it takes a very long time to get meaningful evaluation and to see how these are working. Um, and I, I think it's... Uh, a lot of people don't experience, don't uh, undertake these programmes, um, which every so often you see a story in the paper about, you know, majority of sex offenders being released without receiving any sort of intervention or any sort of training. Uh, and even, uh, and even, and, and I think that that, um, so I think there's it's definitely a way of kind of considering that, it's possible to see that the lack of programming or the lack of intervention um, is a problem. But there's also research on a, a kind of a, a way of thinking in criminology is, um, is called assistance studies. And that's the study about what it is that makes people stop, uh, stop committing crime or, or, or empirical research into what are the, the, are the conditions under which people stop living criminal lives and stop committing crime. And what research and assistance shows is that most of the time, the things that help people stop offending from all types of offending is actually nothing to do with kind of formal structured interventions of that type. It's things like getting older um, is a big part of it. Uh, it's things like getting a girlfriend, it's getting a job, it's getting a stable life, it's changing the way that you see yourself. So while there, um, there, are, there are structured interventions, not a lot of people do them, and most of the time during the sentence they're not doing them, they're doing other stuff. Um, but I think that we need to look beyond kind of formal and structured interventions psychologically as the way by which people are going to change their behaviour. Mm -hmm. And kind of just to add to that, so like my, my job in prison was to, to run groups. And before I was kind of trusted to just go off and do what I wanted, there is like formal structured groups that are across the prison estate that you're meant to, to run and lots of them are very basic and we measure them in a we measure the outcomes of them in a way that's very easy to measure so does the prisoner say that he is less likely to use smoke cannabis after doing this group yes he is okay this kind of measurement and if you are the kind of offender that comes and goes comes and goes comes and goes you will have done these courses 10 times um, everyone knows how to tick the boxes including the prisoners they know yes miss i'll tick the box for you you'll get a 10 out of 10 today um, and actually, this kind of goes back to the unlock graduates thing as well. I think the thing that's so good in places like Norway, they have, the officers have a, so much training around ethics, philosophy, psychology, that it's not necessarily these structured interventions that make the difference in prison. 
Um, I think there are the relationships between staff and prisoners. I think it's the culture of respect and pro-social modelling and the way we speak to people and show how we expect people to behave by showing that ourselves that actually makes the majority of the difference. Um, I ran therapy groups kind of every morning in prison and they weren't structured, they didn't follow a government guideline, um, which makes them very hard to measure and very hard to say that, that they should be replicated across the prison estate. And I also think the real problem with those kind of things is they're often, as you mentioned, they're based on passionate people doing things that they're passionate about. They're very hard to replicate um, and very hard to measure and therefore very hard to get funding for. Um, but I think if we followed a kind of Norwegian model of training our staff in the importance of relationships, perhaps we would see greater results than our um, programmes, our structured programmes that were set to deliver. <clears throat> Great, we'll take a question just there. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could tell me if there is um, peer support. So you mentioned Alcoholics Anonymous and not NA and unhelpful support or the 10 minute option. <laughs> um, but is, are there reoffenders, uh, sorry, reformed offenders supporting others after release? You will, you will often find that, I mean, our, our one success during my time as an addictions counsellor is now doing that, actually. He goes into prisons every now and then. Um, I, I think you, you have this real difficulty that, that ties into what you're saying, Angela, is that if you're in a prison cell, you'll do anything to get out of it, right? It's really boring. It's, it's horrible. So if you're offered an AA meeting or an NA meeting, you'll, you'll very often find um, people go into it. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, my background was in Narcotics Anonymous. I'm quite dubious about the effectiveness of that for really marginalised people. And when I say that, we, we did an evaluation of, of, we looked at people who have been in treatment for 10, 20 years in, in York, many of them former offenders, um, and across 30 people, not one of us mentioned any interest or engagement with 12-step programmes. And, and I think, you know, so we do see those groups go in. We see people sometimes talk very positively about the structured treatment programmes delivered by what used to be wrapped and is mm -hmm. now... Forward Trust. Forward Trust, um, who do deliver 12-step uh, programmes. They were really struggling to engage heroin users when we went in, but they said they're often uh, more effective. Um, I think more broadly, um, yeah, you're also dependent on prison regimes. So even when you're running 12 NA or, or AA in groups in principle, you need the staff member there, you need people to escort on the prisoners from cells. You need, so even then, it, it, it's somewhat um, unreliable. I know of no structured programme for doing that other than um, the non-statutory agency work that, that we discussed earlier. So you'll, you'll often find in those non-statutory agencies that a lot of people are like me, you know, because what else do you do? If, if, you, if your life is screwed by drugs, what do you do but go and work in drugs? Would I be a drugs researcher if I hadn't used loads of drugs? I don't know. Maybe I'd be an electronic engineer or something to you earlier, Russell. So what I do in my spare time. I don't go and read books about drugs. Maybe I'd be something entirely different. I think there is that thing that, that when you're stigmatised, you know, these are the options you take, and so you do find people working in those. I mean, I mean, one of the interesting things is how, how difficult the vetting rules make it for, yeah. some, for an ex-offender to actually go into the probation service as an employed person. And it's actually got more difficult now that the services come back into the public sector because the public sector has tougher rules than the previous private companies had and actually some of the <coughs> whatever their fault some of the community rehabilitation companies were actually doing some quite innovative things in terms of employing ex-offenders to run induction courses or, or offering them jobs as, as PSOs the more junior grade of probation and they've, they've had to tupee those people into the public sector and actually some of them are still waiting to, to get clearance so you know, I think there's a big, big debate to be had about the, the role of ex-offenders in exactly, not just in voluntary organisations, but actually in the probation service itself, I think. Just a very, <clears throat> very quick one about that in prison. In prison, we have people in prison working for the Samaritans as listeners um, who absolutely save lives every single day in prison. And also prisoners working for the Shannon Trust who teach mm. other prisoners how to read. So in prison, you see a lot of peer support. And I think that's why I say, like, I see the good in people. You see that a lot inside prison. 
And it is worth saying, I mean, a lot of, I mean, the prison state is not fit for purpose, but a lot of good things do happen in yeah. some prisons, and some prisons are very innovative. And a colleague of where I first met Alice at the Institute of Criminology called Alison Liebling has a, a project on what makes a good prison. You, you won't be surprised given what Andrew just said, that respect, I mean, things that aren't necessarily expensive, security, respect, and fairness actually make a huge difference. Um, and you can do those things and if you're interested in, since we've, we've, we haven't really talked very much about the, any positive sides, if you're interested, I really do suggest you look it up. I mean, it's Alison Liebling, what makes a good prison, or, uh, and, and the work I mean, I, Yeah, I mean, I, and I've been to the prison that Alison prayed at Warren Hill, which is, um, tries to get people through who are on IPPs progressed to, to release. And it, it, there's a very different feel about that place in terms of the the way that uh, prisoners and staff interact with each other. And, uh, it's well, well worth a visit if you ever get a chance. Um, we're almost out of time and we have to finish on time so I'm going to ask the, the sort of classic chair's last question and only give you, you know, less than a minute each <laughs> if you could change one thing if you had the power to change one thing tomorrow uh, what would you change? Just The attitude of the Treasury towards funding anything to do with prisons which has been the bane of my life for the last 20 years <laughs> Uh, understanding that prisons are part of a welfare system, money needs to go elsewhere in order to keep people out and support people after. In addition to th the things I've already mentioned, um, I would undo recent changes to child life sentences that try to bring up uh, the minimum tariff for child lifers to be essentially in line with adult uh, imprisonment, um, which is against the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child and also the House of Commons and House of Lords Joint Committee on Human Rights said would disproportionately affect black and minority ethnic children. So I'd probably get rid of child life sentences and I'd also, if I couldn't do that, shrink them massively. And in line with everything everyone else has said, um, it was mentioned briefly earlier today, um, I would make sure we resentenced every single person on an IPP sentence. And if you don't know about IPP, I would implore you to kind of go and find out um, more about these sentences and see what kind of a miscarriage of justice they are. Um, on, there's an organisation called UNGRIP, U-N-G-R-I-P-P. -P. Um, which does a lot of campaigning on IPPs, so look them up. Great. So before I thank them, let me again thank um, Joan and the festival team for, for the day, the, the CNJB Morel Trust for the funding. Again, I said it this morning, thank you to the audience. It is fantastic that you're here. Your contributions are the thing that make the festival what they are, so thank you very much, and many congratulations on being here at 4.30 on a, on a very warm Sunday. Um, again, as I said this morning, I, I have a blurb for saying thank you. I'm not going to go through the blurb. I, it was a tremendous, a tremendous session informed by real expertise and, and genuine humanity. So can we thank our four panellists?